This is a, a new experimental area of medicine. We have extremely poor data, but the countries that have done the most rigorous methods of evidence analysis are backing away from it, and they're backing away from it quickly. Dr. Lior Sapir, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, where he focuses on the research behind pediatric gender medicine and the policies different countries have taken on this area of practice. And my good friend, Sandy Moore, she is a celebrated advocate for the trans community. And we've been friends for a long time. It's good to see you again. And good you, to see you, you too, came Dr. in Dale. on really short notice. So thank you for doing that. I did. I appreciate it. Anything for you, Dr. Shiro. Let me ask you, out of everything that you've been listening to, are, are you surprised, we were just talking with Jamie and she was saying that this has really been kind of a reactive sort of thing without the clinical protocols that you would expect to screen these patients, particularly these young patients, before instituting a protocol. Is that an isolated situation or is this something that's more widespread? It is absolutely widespread. What Jamie is describing is systemic and it flows from the nature of the treatment protocol itself and, and, and the ideology that underwrites it. And that ideology is called gender affirming care, which is why I don't prefer to use that term. I prefer a more neutral scientific term, which is sex trait modification or pediatric sex trait modification. Gender affirming care is a term of approval. It's marketing. Uh, in the same way that child abuse, calling this child abuse, is also a term of disapproval. These are moral terms. But the neutral scientific term is, is sex trait modification. And what Jamie is describing, what we know based on data, is happening at most, if not all, clinics across the United States. I wish that when I started my transition, I was able to transition earlier in life because that helps you be more feminine or more masculine by using the blockers. You know, that helps people blend in society more. Mm -hmm. I say something about... Please. Uh, the idea that kids know who they are. Um, I think the very existence of detransitioners shows that that's not true. Because these kids arrived at the clinic confident, 100% convinced that they knew who they were. Their parents were 100% convinced, apparently because they gave consent, um, that, that these treatments are, are correct. Um, and yet, these kids, uh, very shortly after they got double mastectomies or subjected their bodies to irreversible, often sterilizing treatments, and by the way, if you do the full course of medical transition, even just hormonal, um, it is guaranteed chemical castration for the rest of your life. And these kids went into that office knowing who they are, and yet very quickly after that regretted it. And uh, no less important, the doctors who saw them were convinced that these kids know who they are, and they got it But right. how often does that and, happen? Okay, so great question. Yes. Um, in order to have a good, reliable picture of the rates of detransition, we're gonna have to wait at least another decade, probably two. That's, by the way, what clinicians in Europe are saying now, because uh, regret can take a long time to manifest. If you got your breast amputated at the age of 15, the full consequences of that may not be apparent to you until you're in your mid-30s and can't breastfeed. But current research does show, I mean, we have one research paper from 2021 that showed a 30% discontinuation rate of hormones. And, uh, you know, that rate is likely to go up and up and up because the protocol being used at these clinics is kids know who they are. There's no safeguarding, there's no second guessing of a kid's stated identity. And the fewer safeguards we have, the, fewer, the less questioning that we do of these kids' uh, motives and, and mindset, the, the higher the rate of regret and detransition and medical harm is going to be. So when your research can produce that, then we can take that. But your research doesn't produce that. Well, I'm curious if Shandy ever had any doubts or second thoughts in her journey, and I'll ask her that right after the break. <laughs> This medicine is like the bridge between me saying that I'm trans and being trans. They would split them up at preschool, like girls on this side, boys on that side, and she would go with the girls and they would explain like, you're a boy, you need to go over here. And she started to become really distressed about it. One day she came home and the teacher had told her that God made you a boy. 
And she crawled up in my lap and she said, how can I get God to change his mind? And just cried. So I went out and bought her dresses. Well, we're back and we're talking about how young is too young to transition. You've been listening to what Jamie said and, and some of those that were having really bad reactions to the treatment protocols. And what do you think about what she's had to say? I mean, these are real lived experiences that she's spent in four and a half years at a clinic. That's not how it works at our clinic. And you just don't hop into things that way. It takes time. And as uh, the doctor said, that there isn't enough time, but I think out of working in this area for 12 years, maybe I've seen two people who changed their mind on their transition out of all the hundreds of patients that we've seen. So that's why I can say that sometimes they do or say that they know who they are because that's been the track record that has been what I've seen. Did, so you ever have any, did you ever have any doubts? My only thing is that I didn't do it soon enough. I was so focused on what people were going to say to my parents and what kind of questions they were going to be asked. And, you know, I was living for everybody except for myself. So finally, when I did wake up and decide that today is the day you need to start living for you and not focusing on what everybody else is thinking and what they're going through, that's when my life kind of kicked off and I was able to start really living life as it's supposed to be lived. Mm -hmm. Can I say something about the, uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe you that um, you've only seen two kids who have said we, we regret it. Mm -hmm. um, in 2021, a researcher and physician by the name of Lisa Littman conducted a survey of 100 detransitioners. Mm -hmm. And she found that 75%, so 75 of the detransitioners said, that after they had experienced regret um, uh, about the harm that was inflicted upon them by the doctors, they never went back to those doctors. Um, in other words, the system had completely forgotten about them. And that is a, a constant recurring problem in this area of medicine that uh, clinicians and uh, you know, those who kind of operate within the gender uh, clinic environment believe that, that the rates of regret uh, are extremely low because all of the kids who are regretting it don't come back to them, and for good reason. Um, so I just think it's, it's very important to put this into context. This is a, a new experimental area of medicine. We have extremely poor data, but the countries that have done the most rigorous methods of evidence analysis are backing away from it, and they're backing away from it quickly. What is your advice to a parent that has a child that says, I want to transition, I want to make a change? I think that the American Academy of Pediatrics actually needs to go back and inform pediatricians. Yeah. The problem is, is that these kids are exploring, questioning, or having concerns about their gender. They're going to a pediatrician's office, and instead of the pediatrician doing their job, they're immediately referring these kids to a specialty gender center. The pediatrician needs to inform the parent, it is okay for your child to explore things about their gender. Yeah. Wear whatever clothes you want. If the little boys want to put on nail polish, who cares? If they wanna wear their hair different or experiment and play with different kinds of toys, those should be things that the pediatricians are telling parents, let your children explore. But instead what we're doing is we're taking a child who has questions at all and we're pigeonholing them and telling them, no, you're trans, no, you're trans. We need to open up how we express gender in our society so that you never had the experience where you couldn't feel like you could walk down the street. I wish that that would have been changed, that instead of changing our kids' bodies, we would change our society so that we would not be beating up people for walking down the street dressed differently. Yep.